I have a question for you. Are you living in a new covenant context? It is so easy to be in the new covenant, but to mix our Christianity with the old covenant mixture. And that's one reason why Paul was quite angry with the church at Galatia. He said, what makes you think that you started living your Christian life in the spirit, but you think you're going to perfect it to experience it better by moving into your flesh? And he got quite angry with them. And he, called, he said, oh, foolish Galatians. And what that word really means there is unthinking Galatians. He's not saying you're all stupid. What he's saying is you're not reflecting. Oh, unreflecting Galatians. You're not using your brain and thinking this through. You know, God has given us a salvation of great depth. And we are on a discovery journey, discovering our salvation. Do you know that? We're not, we are not working to adequacy, we are living from adequacy. Isn't that great? I want to bring you something this morning from Scripture using these two verses as texts. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. I'm going to focus on that phrase poured out. In the old King James English, it says shed abroad, <laughs> shed abroad, which we don't really use in our language. I want to focus on that phrase poured out. And in Titus chapter 3, if you've got your, your phones or your Bibles there, let's go to Titus chapter 3, verse 3. And this is the only other time Paul ever uses that phrase, shed abroad or poured out. So Titus 3, verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So where it says, whom he poured out, what the Koine Greek is saying there, it's the Holy Ghost that was poured out on you, that was poured out on us at salvation, that was poured out in Acts chapter 2 on the church. And so that word poured out, got my attention because I guess we think of maybe a cup of tea that we, we did, forgot to drink, we pour it down the sink. That's not what this means. That word there means richly poured out to be copiously given, over the top, plenty, widely distributed, abundant or richly. It's sort of like when Jesus fed the 5,000 and there were 12 baskets full left over. See that pouring out more than enough, way more than enough. That's what Paul's getting at, getting at here when he said the, the love of God has been poured out to you and the Holy Ghost has been poured out to you. And the way I would describe it is this that there is a spilling over of the resources from the Father to the Son that then comes to us through the Holy Ghost. So we could say the Father 
gives all the resources to the son, and then the son, that, 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 everything the father's given to the son spills over to us. And I've deliberately gone that way, not this way, because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the father, and you are a joint heir with Jesus. So that's why I haven't done this. <laughs> I'm doing this. Father to son, to us. In fact, in John chapter 16, 15, John 16, 15, it says this, all things that the Father has are mine. See, all things that the Father has are now Jesus's. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Okay, um, in the Amplified, it says it this way. I will take the things that are mine and will reveal it to you, brackets, declare, disclose, transmit. So what Jesus is saying here is that I'll take everything the Father's given to me and I'm going to give it to you. So when he said declare it, he's not just saying I'm going to talk to you about it and maybe one day we'll have a Bible and you can read all about it. He's saying that when Jesus says, he, I will declare it, he's meaning he's going to pour it out to you so you can experience that resurrection life and power that the Father gave to the Son. You've now got it. And it doesn't just mean it happened in Acts 2 because that poured out phrase, that shed abroad phrase, in the Koine Greek, it's aorist tense, which means... It has no regard for past, present, or future. In other words, that pouring out, that spilling over of God's love and the Holy Ghost to you wasn't a one-off event. It didn't just happen at Calvary. It just didn't happen in Acts chapter 2. It's an ongoing event. In your daily life, you have a spilling over from the Father to the Son into your life. You have God's love spilled over. You have the Holy Spirit. You have sonship, grace, everything the Father has, the Son has spilled over to you. Wow. Isn't that fantastic? And what we are doing every day, we are discovering what I just said. Because I don't think any of us are walking in the fullness of that. Okay, so we are discovering it. And that's one reason why we come to church. We, we experience the spillover of God's presence. We, we get the seed of his word in our heart and we, we, we experience his grace. We have fellowship one with another the, the, and the love flows. There's a grace that flows from member to member. God's love flows from member to member as we have a cup of coffee and so on. Okay, so... Um, uh, that is ours to experience. Uh, even Jesus said in, in uh, John chapter 14, 12 to 14, he said, we will do his works. See, that's part of that spilling over. And this spilling over isn't just a trickle. You know, like Oliver Twist. Sir, can I have some more, please? Don't belt me if I ask. No. Nah. This is not Charles Dickens' territory. This is Holy Ghost territory. You've got all you need and more. You've got 12 baskets full, left over of everything you need. You are sons and daughters of God. You have his Holy Spirit. You have his wisdom. You have his grace. You have his love. You have his resurrection life. And one day that will be manifest literally. One day when we die, it's only the body that dies. We don't die. We have eternal life. So I, I want to get into some practicalities here. There are two ways that God's love and the Spirit, I'm focusing this morning more on the Holy Ghost, how that Spirit spills over to us. One is there is the Spirit in us, and shortly I'll come to there is the Spirit on us. So firstly, let's get practical here. Please turn to Romans 8. There's an aspect of this I want to pull out because 
there's so much to this, but there's just one that I want to, uh, to pull out this morning. Romans 8. Um, just while you're turning there, um, for those who love Bible study, Romans 8 is the most holy place. This is where the bloodstained mercy seat is. This is where the altar of incense is behind the veil. Some Christians visit Romans 8. Other Christians live in Romans 8. I pray that this would be a church that you live there and not just visit there. Amen? That's what I want. That's my prayer for you. So uh, we, we, we can start in Romans 8.1. There is therefore no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. See, there's the bloodstained mercy seat behind the veil right there. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And by the way, we'll come to it in a moment. That's not a behavioral thing. That's a positional thing. Verse 9 says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If the spirit of God dwells in you. So you're in the spirit. Do you know that? If you have the Spirit of God in you, you're in the Spirit. Nothing spooky kooky about it. It's positional. It's a sonship thing. And when I say sonship, that's not male, female. That's an inheritance thing that I'm talking about. Okay, let's go on. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So this spilling over of the Spirit in you when you were reborn, when you were born again, and you got a brand new spirit that freed you away from sin and its consequences. That's what that's saying there. Let's go to verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is life and peace. I'll just stop there for a minute. Verse 6 is a guarantee. If you live according to the flesh, we all know what happens when we listen to our flesh. Death happens, doesn't it? But when we live according to the Spirit, life flows. I think we've all experienced that. If you haven't been in the Lord long, here's a little warning for you. If you live according to the flesh... It will kill you. But if you live according to the Spirit, it will bring life to you and your family and those who you touch. Hallelujah. Verse 7, Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, it, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, but, to, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. But the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. There's the spilling over. You have the resurrection life of Christ in you right now. So we're going to unpack this a little bit more in a moment. But there's just something I want to pull out between verses 12 and 17. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not according to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Now, what does that mean? What that means is we disown the righteous claims. Sorry, we disown the unrighteous claims of the flesh. The unrighteous claims of the flesh says, do what I say. Do what I want. You'll feel good. Those unrighteous claims, we now disown them. Okay? We are not a slave to that anymore. We have been disconnected from the flesh. That active nerve of the flesh has been disconnected. Let's keep going. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as, as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. 
This is part of the spilling over. You are a son. And what he's talking about there is inheritance. Because uh, even, if, even if a son was adopted and then, the, then they had children later, the adopted son still got the inheritance because the adopted son was as good as the blood son, if you know what I'm saying. Okay? So if we're led by the Spirit, we are the sons of God. We get the inheritance. What, what, what's that scripture? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And we are discovering that every day. That's why I'm excited about being a Christian. I'm excited about being on this journey with Jesus. I'm discovering stuff every day. Okay, I'm getting carried away here. You'll have to stop me. Okay, this is the part I, I want to bring out here. Verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So we could say it this way. That my, my Holy Spirit energized spirit, my Holy Spirit energized spirit agrees with the Holy Spirit that I'm a son. That's what that's saying. I'm, I'm just trying to put in different wording what it means uh, when it says bears witness, okay? My Holy Spirit energized spirit that I got at the new birth is now in agreement with the Holy Ghost that I'm a son and I'm an heir to salvation. In verse 15, uh, 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, we may be glorified together. Now, when it talks about if we suffer with him, so I'm just trying to be a bit practical here about this spilling over. This is to do with the unrighteous claims of the flesh. So when you tell the flesh, no, I'm going to obey God, that's what it means if you suffer with him. <laughs> you you no longer have the spirit of fear that I'm going to miss out that if I don't please my flesh. That if I disobey God, you no longer fear that you are going to be worse off. You no longer fear, that didn't come out right. You no longer fear that if I please my f flesh, I'm going to miss out. For if we suffer with him, in other words, if I act against myself and do what Christ wants, that is suffering with Christ. But I'll be glorified with him. You see, Jesus acted against himself all his life. He did everything the Father wanted. And look what happened. He was resurrected to power to sit at the right hand of the Father. So part of the spilling over of the Spirit is you don't have to give in to the unrighteous claims of your flesh when it comes knocking on your door Monday to Saturday and says, do it my way. Start fearing. Go into unbelief. You start doing things your way. Don't worry about faith. Don't worry about Jesus. Don't worry about God's stuff. You do it your way. You take matters into your hands. And the world will say, if you work hard enough at something, you can have it. That's worldly philosophy. We don't have to fear that stuff. Okay, We have the Holy Ghost. And when you do suffer with him and you're feeling like, you know, the trapeze artist, he goes from one trapeze and he's in the air spinning. Hey, how many times in life are we in the middle and we're spinning? Oh God, I better reach that next trapeze. It's a long way down. Okay. When you're in the middle there, you just say, thank you, Lord, in faith. I'm going to act right now. And I don't have to fear whatever is supposed to happen to me, what my flesh is warning me about. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to do what the Spirit says. 
And when you do that, you'll be glorified with him. And one day it'll be literal, a resurrected body, because God's intention is to bring back Eden, make heaven and earth one again. Wow. Oh boy, there's a big subject there. Moving right along. Okay, so that's the spirit in you. Okay, now the spirit on you. Um, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to the 11 remaining disciples, He says this You will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. So we're not just talking in you now. Now there's an upon word here that Jesus used. Um, and you will be witnesses to me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Okay, so not that you will just do witnessing, you'll be witnesses. But what Jesus was saying was, hey, fellas, don't go planting any churches yet until the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Don't do anything yet. Don't build churches. Don't even bother witnessing until 40 days in advance, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. Don't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then we know 40 days later in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit falls upon the church. And those who receive Christ, the Spirit comes in them. Um, in Acts 4.33, just a couple of more of these. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them all. Acts 10, 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. Acts 19, 6. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with other tongues. So there's part of this divine spillover, this divine overflow is that the Spirit comes in us for practical living every day, but there are times the Holy Spirit will come upon you to be a witness. You know, I used to, I was either or about this in the past. I thought, well, that's old English or something because the Spirit's in me. The Spirit can't come upon me. You know, that, that's just semantics. There are times that even though the Spirit's in you, the Spirit comes upon you and activates what's in you and there is a, 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 an unction on you where you can be a witness. So part of this divine spillover to you is the spirit in you and the spirit on you. For Monday to Saturday, when you're with your loved ones, when you're in your workplaces, when there are times you fear, you know, you get that mortgage letter in the mail, how am I going to pay this? Times like that, you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you're... Holy Spirit, energized spirit, agreeing with you that you are safe in God's arms. That's part of your inheritance. Amen. No wonder why Paul says to Timothy, you haven't got a spirit of fear, but of power, love, sound mind, self-discipline, an ability to be calm to be well balanced under pressure. That's what Paul was telling Timothy, who was a high thinker. His anxiety levels rose very quick. And Paul said, hey, it's all right. You haven't got a spirit of fear to fail. Just try again. Go again. Put one foot in front of the other. Just be well balanced. Be calm. Just listen to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so... Um, can I do page down or are you going to do that? Can, can, yeah, okay. So I've just got some things here, just straight from the word to show you um, aspects of the spillover from father to son to you that is yours and available every moment of every day. Okay, so your new birth is brought about by the Holy Spirit. You can read the scriptures there, I won't read them out. By the way, if you want these slides... Come and see me, I can email them to you. Or you can take photos or whatever. The spirit indwells your spirit, energized spirit. What a privilege we have, amen? I remember one person said, I decided to be an atheist. 
and it lasted one day because she said, I realized that I lost everything. By the end of the next day, she was back with the Lord. You know, sometimes we take for granted what we have, don't we? I think we're all, we all do that sometimes. The Spirit gives you assurance of salvation. The Spirit fills you with himself. By the baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit enables you to speak in unknown languages. Page down, thanks. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. The Holy Spirit opens your understanding of the things of God. The Holy Spirit teaches you and guides you into all truth. The Holy Spirit imparts life. The Holy Spirit brings renewal. That renewal, that, that, that's, like a, that's why I say God hasn't stopped creating. Because your outward person is, being, is perishing day by day. But my inward person, I've got to say it scripturally, the inward man feels better. <laughs> that's not male or female. That's everyone is being renewed day by day. C creation continues in me. The Holy Spirit strengthens your inner being. Has anybody ever had times when you're just feeling lower than a snake's belly? And somehow that word comes, that verse comes, that hug comes at church. Something just comes that just renews you and, and gives you strength to go again. I wrote a song once called Here I Go Again. <laughs> there was a time I just crashed and burned. I thought it was over. And the Holy Ghost began to just reveal to me my position in Christ, who Christ is, reveal the new covenant, reveal Jesus, reveal, reveal my identity in Christ. And I thought, yep, here I go again. Let's go again, Lord. Let's do this. <laughs> the Holy Spirit enables you to pray. Ever had times you don't know how to pray? Ukraine. How on earth do I pray for Ukraine? You just start. Go into, go into tongues or something. The Holy Spirit will help you. Page down, thanks. The Holy Spirit enables you to worship in spirit and truth. Do you know one of the few things in Scripture that the Father seeks? One of them is worshippers that are real. Spirit and truth, that's real. Not going through the motions, not just turning up to church, but they're worshipping because they love him, and that's real from their spirit. The Holy Spirit leads you. Uh, I'll just say on that, sometimes we don't know what to do. Here's my advice. Go through the green lights until you lose your peace. When you lose your peace, stop. The Holy Spirit will be there to help you. The Holy Spirit enables you to put fleshly deeds that lead to death to death. We've spoken about that already. The Holy Spirit produces Christ-likeness in character and fruit in your life. The Holy Spirit gives a calling to you for special service. The Holy Spirit strengthens your inner being. And one more. The Holy Spirit guides you into ministry. Um, the Holy Spirit empowers you and gives boldness to you to witness. We've spoken about that. The Holy Spirit imparts spiritual gifts to you as he wills. The Holy Spirit will bring resurrection and immortality to your body in the last day. Hallelujah. What a hope we have. We've got to get the message out there. Amen. That's an amazing truth. And the Holy Spirit is desperately yearning to help you. Um, the old King James says, the spirit lusteth to envy. <laughs> okay. What that means is the Holy Spirit is doing everything he can to help you. You know, when you're at rock bottom and you've got nowhere to go, he's there just helping you. You know, what's that scripture that there's a smoking reed he will not snuff out? You know, um, a broken reed he will not break. You know, when you're just a smoking reed, there's nothing left. The Holy Spirit's there going, come on, just a bit more. You can do That's it. Come on. We're going to do this together. And then gradually you're back on your feet. That's what it means. The Holy Spirit lusteth to envy. He's desperately yearning to help you, to assist you, to reveal the word. 
For some of you, if this is a dead book to you, just get with God this week and say, God, I don't know how to read this. I need help. Please show me. Reveal Jesus to me in this book. Reveal yourself, Father. I need you. And I promise you, I promise you, he will answer that prayer. He loves that prayer. He loves it. He will answer. So that's in you as a believer. And just one more slide on the spillover of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Okay, the Holy Spirit formed the church on the day of Pentecost and baptized the living members into the spiritual body. Uh, we are immersed into the body at water baptism. If you've been water baptized, you're not just committing your life to God. You are baptized. You are immersed into the body of Christ. You are plunged into his body. The Spirit formed the church to be the new and living temple. I love what Peter talks about. I haven't, I, don't think, I haven't got the scripture there. But you are living stones in the living temple. The Holy Spirit brings anointing, illumination, direction to the church, brings gifts. And the last point there, the Holy Spirit is the agent of direction and government of the church. Jesus is the head of the church and directs the affairs and so on. Um, so uh, just go on the last slide, please. Just the last slide. Thank you. So in Isaiah 11 and in Revelation 4, it talks about the seven spirits of God. Okay, it says the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. These are seven aspects of the life of the spillover of the spirit that is not just in heaven. This is now on the earth. And these seven aspects of the spirit have been released from heaven and is now spilled over into the life of the church and you personally. Isn't that wonderful? Trying to find my pick. We'll end. I just want to end with... I want to end with part of a song we've already sang in a moment. But I want to end with a challenge to you. Not since the Garden of Eden, all the way to Malachi in the Old Testament, no one had experienced what Adam experienced in the Garden until Jesus came. Jesus was the tree of life. That came amongst the twelve. Can you imagine what it was like to have the tree of life walk and talk with you every day? To sit across the table with you at a meal and you ask him any question and he gives you the perfect answer? He looks into your soul and he's able to help you with your issues. Then one day, Jesus says to those twelve, Fellas, I have to leave. I have to go. Because if I don't, I can't send you the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to go. Do you know why? Because it's to your advantage that I leave. Because I can only be in one place at one time. But the Holy Spirit is going to come and be in you. And upon you to do everything you need. It's to your advantage that I leave. The challenge I want to bring you is this. This new culture that we find ourselves in. The sexual revolution. Everything that's happened in the West. I, I, could we all agree that. The West has changed in eight to ten years. Like even I landed in Scotland in 2011. It's not the same Scotland I landed in. It's a totally different Scotland. That's how quick things have changed. Friends, we are not going to move forward unless we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. We must walk 
with the Holy Ghost. I've been praying, Lord, we need signs and wonders like never before. Lord, what happened to the healings that we had in the 70s and 80s? Lord, we need them again. I can remember as a teenager in the 70s, during the preaching of the word, people would be healed. Does anybody remember that? Is that anybody? Yeah. God, we need that again. Friends, if we're going to, we can't just sleepwalk into the future. We must go in the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus' life didn't have programs and gimmicks. He just listened to the Father through the Spirit. The Holy Ghost is not a doctrine. He's a living person that lives in you. Amen? Oh, yes, of course. We're not just conjuring up something. We're not willing something to work. We're not just hoping for the best. We are cooperating with the Holy Ghost that he would activate that spillover that we have. So I say to you, Whitburn Church, go in the power of the Spirit. Go in the power of the Holy Ghost. Listen to his wisdom. You don't have to fear. Okay, if you suffer with him, you will be glorified with him. You don't have to listen to the unrighteous claims of the flesh. We're not debtors to the flesh. Go in the power of the Spirit. Listen to him. Listen to his wisdom. The Word and the Spirit will work together for you. Fill yourself. Be being filled with the Holy Ghost. And live that victorious life. Because we are facing our kids, my grandkids, six years old and ten. What world are they going to be living in? I'm praying for them nearly every day that they would know Jesus and that their hearts would be awakened by the Spirit. Amen. Let's just stand. Death could not hold you. What a powerful name it is. And as we do that, let's just cry out to God and say, God, we need your Spirit. We need you to reveal Christ to us. We need you to help guide us how to navigate what we're about to walk into, whatever that is. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for that divine spillover of the Holy Ghost. Lord, that you've poured out, Lord, to each one of us. Jesus, that you just didn't contain it for yourself. But Lord, you poured it out in copious amounts to 12 basketfuls left over of the Holy Ghost, of the love of God that we need this morning. And so, Father, as we leave today, Lord, I pray that you would awaken our our spirit, energize, activate our spirits. Lord, that we would be conscious of your Holy Ghost, that we would hear your Holy Spirit, to be harmonized with your will, to harmonize, to synchronize with your nature, with your word, with righteousness. And that that would lead us into how you want us to live and navigate the future. Lord, I pray for each one here. Lord, there's probably some that have said, well, I'm not good enough to live in that power of the Spirit, that resurrection life. Lord, I pray you would show them it's just a matter of faith, of agreeing with you, agreeing with your word, agreeing with your name and nature, and you do the rest. Because that's the power. It's not us, it's you. So bless each one. Bless this church, Lord. Father, may it increase in graces and giftings and power, we pray. Amen. God bless you real good.